I'm sure we all use primitive types all over our code, things like integers, strings, booleans, and so on. So I'm curious if you're familiar with the concept of primitive obsession. Hi, my name is Milan, and welcome to another video in the Clean Architecture and Domain Driven Design series. In this video, I'm going to focus on the concept of primitive obsession, and I'm also going to introduce you to value objects and see how we can use them to solve primitive obsession. So without further ado, let's go into the code. Here I have the member entity, and as you can see, it's pretty simple. It only contains three string properties, first name, last name, and email. Now, strings are considered primitive types in C-sharp, and can this be a problem sometimes? Let's see where we are calling our constructor from. As you can see, it has one reference, which is in the create member command handler. So I'm going to head on over there to see what we have. Inside of the handle method, we are creating a new member using the information passed in by the create member command. And let's check it out real quick. It only has the email, the first name, and the last name of the member that we want to create. Back to our command handler. Here we are creating a new member instance by calling the constructor that I just showed you. We are adding the member to the member repository. Then we are saving the changes using unit to work and we just return from the method. So I mentioned that string being a primitive type can sometimes be problematic. And let me show you when this is the case. What would happen if I were to move around the parameters that we were passing into the member constructor? For example, instead of passing in the email, I can pass in the first name and then I can pass in the email and let's leave the last name where it was. Notice that this will compile, it will work, but it's going to assign the wrong values to the wrong properties. And when you are using primitive types, these kind of things are easy to overlook and happen more often than you may think. Another problem is here we are using strings to represent a concept that is more complex than a simple string. For example, the first name and last name do have a string value, but they may also have certain constraints within our domain. Imagine that the maximum length of a first name and last name is 50 characters. How would you enforce this constraint. Also, how would you validate that a string being passed in as an email is actually a valid email address? As you can see, primitive types fall short when we are trying to implement something more complex. And this is where value objects come in. They can help us improve the design of our domain while enforcing the necessary constraints. I'm going to revert this to the state that we found it in initially. All right. And I'm going to create our value object base class, and then we will see how we can use it. Inside of the primitives folder, I'm going to add a new class, which I will call value object. Move to the file scope namespace. I'm going to make the class public, and I'm going to make it abstract, because I don't want anyone to be creating instances of the value object class. You can only create an instance of a class inheriting from a value object. So what do we need to define a value object? In domain-driven design, a value object is a type that is defined only by its values. If two value objects have the same values, they are considered equal. Another very important constraint for value objects is that they are immutable by design. So let's see how we would implement a value object. I'm going to define a public abstract method, which is going to return an unenumerable collection of objects, and I'm going to call it getAtomicValues. This abstract method will be implemented by all of the value objects inheriting from the value object base class. And inside of this method, they will have to define what are the components that define this value object structure. I'll show you in just a moment how we can use this. If we leave the value object base class like this, we still aren't enforcing equality based on the values of our value object. So let us implement this constraint. I'm going to create a private method that is going to return a boolean and I'm going to call it values are equal. It's going to accept a second value object. And these two value objects are equal if their values are identical. For this purpose, I can say get atomic values. Then I can use the sequence equal method that is coming from the link queue namespace. And to this method, I'm going to pass in the atomic values of the other object. So what this method does is it returns true if the atomic values of both of the value objects are the same while respecting the order of the values returned by the getAtomicValues method. Now I can go ahead and implement the other equality methods. First, I'm going to override the equals method coming from the object class. So these two objects are equal if the object being passed in is a value object, and I'm going to capture that variable. And 
the values of these objects are equal. And I'm going to call this other because this is the convention that I used in the entity class. We also need to override the get hash code method. So let's go ahead and do that. Here I'm going to use some link queue magic. I'm going to call get atomic values and I'm going to use the aggregate method coming from link queue. The seed value is going to be the default integer value. And here I need to provide a lambda method for aggregating our hash code value. And this is going to be as simple as passing in hash code combined. This method accepts an integer value representing our hash code that we, are, that we have calculated so far and the next object that we need to add to the hash code. So this is the equals and hash code methods. Let's also do I equatable of value object. We are going to implement the missing members, which is only the equals method. And we are going to return other is not null and the values of these objects are equal. All right. So this is our value object implementation. Let me adjust the screen so that we can see everything. The most important part here is this abstract get atomic values method. We are going to see in just a moment how it is implemented. And the rest of the method is about enforcing structural equality for our value object class. So let's create a new folder inside of our domain project, which I will call value objects. And the first value object that we are going to create will be, for example, the first name. Let's move to file scope namespace and make this public sealed class first name inheriting from value object. We need to implement the get atomic values method. And here we are going to return the values defining our first name value object. The only value that is relevant for the first name is going to be a string property that is called value and it has only the get method. Why am I only defining the get method? Because I want the first name value object to be immutable by design, meaning once it is instantiated, we cannot change the value of the first name. You could also define the init setter here, but I find that it is not necessary. Let's implement the get atomic values method. Here we are going to use the yield return keywords to define an iterator block and just return our first name value. So this is the definition of our first name value object, but we also need to be able to create it. So let's define a constructor, which accepts a value, and let's use autocomplete to make this quicker. So this is the base implementation for the first name value object, but we still aren't enforcing any constraint. We are just wrapping the string value. This does not bring any additional value over using the string primitive type. Let's imagine that we want to enforce a constraint that the maximum length for the first name is, for example, 50. This is going to be defined by a constant inside of our value object, which will be called max length with a value of 50. There are multiple approaches to enforce this constraint. One option would be inside of the constructor if the value length is greater than the max length, then throw, for example, some argument exception. I generally don't like using this approach because I'm against throwing exceptions inside of a constructor. So I'll show you a different approach. The second approach is going to use the result object, which I talked about in the previous video. So if you haven't watched it, consider going through it now before proceeding with the rest of this video. I'm going to define a public static method for creating a first name and it's going to return a result of first name. I'll call it create and it's going to accept our first name value. Inside of this method, I can check a few things. For example, if string is null or white space, or meaning our first name is empty, we can return a result failure of first name and pass in a new error. For example, first name dot empty and the message first name is empty. All right, let's also check if the length of the first name is greater than the max length. In that case, return a result failure of first name with a new error. And here we say first name, for example, too long with a message of first name is too long. All right. And if all of these checks pass, we can just return the new first name by calling our constructor and passing in the first name value. All right, so this approach 
Although it is more complex, it nicely encapsulates all of the constraints that are necessary for creating a valid first name object. Using this approach becomes even more useful when your value objects are more complex than this, but this is just a trivial example. Let's see how we would use the first name inside of the member class. Remember that we had string here. I'm going to now pass in the value object type instead of a string. And we also need to change the type of the first name property so that everything compiles. In doing this, we have broken the implementation inside of the create member command handler. So we need to fix that. So here we are expecting a first name and not a string. Now I can go ahead and create a first name, but we are not enforcing our constraint. This is because I implemented the logic for enforcing a valid first name inside of the static factory method. In order to prevent anyone from being able to create a new first name without first checking the values, we need to make the constructor inside of the first name value object private. This will force anyone that wants to create a new first name to use our factory method. So let's go back to the create member command handler. We have to call first name create and pass in the string value coming from our command. Now this also won't work because create returns a result of first name and we need the actual first name value to pass it to the constructor. So I'm going to move this into a variable. I'm going to say first name result and here I'm going to pass in first name result value. Notice that creating the first name can fail. So what you would have to do before passing it to the constructor is check that first name result is failure, meaning creating the first name has failed. And in that case, possibly log the error and return from this method. We can use the same approach for turning the email and last name into value objects so that we can enforce some additional constraints. For example, the last name should also have a maximum length of 50 and the email has certain validation rules for what is a valid email. The added benefit is if you look at our member constructor, it's now accepting a first name value object parameter instead of a string. So there's no chance that I can do something like passing in a string here. I will get a compile error. So I'm getting type safety by design. However, when we are using value objects, although we gain type safety, we are significantly increasing the complexity of our solution. You can see that here I'm checking that the first name result is a failure. I need to make sure that creating the first name succeeded. Now, if email and last name were also value objects, this would additionally increase the length of this method. So this is something to watch out for. Value objects are a trade-off. You are getting type safety, immutability, encapsulated constraints inside of the value object. You're also getting structural equality, which can be helpful in certain situations. But this all comes at the cost of increased complexity. You have to decide if this increased complexity is justified for your use case. So just because I showed you value objects in this video does not mean that you should be using value objects in your project. You have to weigh in the pros and cons and then make a decision. At the end of the day, we are software engineers and we have to consider all of the possible options and decide which one is the best for solving the problem that we have. So this was a brief introduction to value objects. I showed you how we can solve primitive obsession by using value objects in our design. However, this comes at the cost of increased complexity, so you have to be aware of this if you want to use this in your projects. I really hope you like this video, and if so, consider leaving it a like. Subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any of my future videos. And until next time, keep being awesome.